Okay, well, I'm going to run through really quick um, just the highlights of Chapter 7 in your pharmacology textbook. Now, this is a ginormous chapter, and there is so much in here. Um, we're going to have to just narrow it down, pare it down a little bit, and take this in bite-sized pieces. So I'm going to go over some of the highlights. Um, very briefly, this was a, I think, 400-slide presentation. I whittled it down to 54 slides. So hopefully this is not too painful, and you'll pick up some pearls that you can effectively use in your paramedic career. Okay. So some things that we're looking at um, when we talk about our cardiac drugs is going to be a type called sympathomimetics. And this is a very large group of drugs. And basically, these are drugs that stimulate or enact the sympathetic nervous system, which we all know is your fight or flight nervous system. Um, that's the one that prepares us to go to battle, so to speak. So, um, Probably the main drug in this category is going to be epinephrine, and we have studied that. We're familiar with that drug. Uh, in layman's terms, that's adrenaline, uh, pure adrenaline. It's formed naturally in the body, but when we give the body an extra boost, it does things like um, dilates our pupils so that we can see better, um, even if it's dark. It does things like vasoconstrict so that we can have a higher blood pressure to pump more oxygen to the nerves and the cells and the muscles that are going to need it because we're preparing for um, a high activity level. Um, it does things like increase our heart rate, can increase our breathing rate. It also does things to minimize our need, and so it shuts down our digestive tract on a temporary basis. So we're not burning up all of that oxygen and energy trying to digest our food when we've got much other um, things at hand that we have to take care of. Another thing that it does is it stimulates our sweat glands. And I think we've talked about this just a little bit, but um, if you think about back in the olden, olden days, like caveman days, when we're talking um, really survival of the fittest, if you stimulated your sweat glands and you became very sweaty and slick, it was harder to hang on to you. So it was easier to get away from a predator or a, an enemy if you were sweaty and slick. So the sweat glands are stimulated. So that's when we see people that are um, maybe having an MI, they sweat profusely, and that's because of that uh, sympathetic nervous system has been stimulated. So you can see here on this slide, uh, epinephrine is one of the main ones there. A norepinephrine is um, another one. Quite honestly, this is rarely, if ever, given in the um, pre-hospital setting. Probably the most common uh, brand name for norepinephrine is Levofed. Um, it's been lovingly nicknamed over the years um, as Leave Them Dead. <laughs> so, um, norepinephrine is also a naturally produced uh, element in the system. So you can see some of these other ones, uh, isoproteranol, dopamine, dobutamine, uh, enamorone, milrinone, and vasopressin. We've talked about vasopressin. It's a presser, much like epinephrine given in cardiac arrest situations for us. Um, dopamine will probably be another one that you want to become very familiar with. Uh, dopamine is something that we use when we've got a patient that is not able to compensate. So um, say we've got someone that's uh, in a state of shock, maybe septic shock, and their heart rate is up, they're vasoconstricted to some degree, uh, but it's just not able to keep up. So we could give them dopamine, which is going to increase the contractility of the heart and vasoconstrict a little bit, um, but it's going to make those each beat of our heart count for more, be more forceful. 
and then it vasoconstricts. Uh, dopamine, when we get to this, it's going to be a very interesting drug. At low doses, it stimulates renal activity. So at low doses, it's going to cause the body to dump fluid through the um, renal system, through the kidneys, and get rid of it, which will lower our blood pressure. In cardiac doses, which is 5 to 20 mics per kilogram per minute, it will cause that increased contractility in the cardiac muscles and vasoconstrict to raise our blood pressure. So in our really sick patients, dopamine is something that is kind of our go-to guy. We'll spend more time with that as we get to that point because it's a bit of a booger to um, dose, and um, it has several different properties. So uh, we'll deal more with that. Dobutamine is very similar to dopamine. It's really not given much in the pre-hospital setting, um, but, again, it's very similar. Milrinone I put on the list because milrinone is a drug that has been recommended by the American Heart Association in the ACLS guidelines to be given specifically for cardiogenic shock. So because it's specifically named, I felt like it is something that you need to know. I'll be real honest with you. I have not talked to a, an EMS service and rarely hospitals that even carry milrinone on a, on a known basis, let alone give it. But because it's specifically talked about um, in those guidelines, I want you to be aware that it's there. Uh, the other um, one is vasopressin, which we have already talked about. Vasopressin can be given in cardiac arrest in place of the first or second epinephrine dose. Give me a second one. There we go. Okay. Um, some other types of drugs um, are the adrener adrenergenic blockers. Okay. And these we lovingly call the lol drugs. Um, propranolol, metropolol, labetalol, atenolol, esmolol. Um, and so all of these are beta blockers. And so when you see that um, LOL on the end, Although, like us, we like to remember that as little old lady on linoleum, uh, or little old lady. Um, these are beta blockers, and if you go back and look at your beta receptors, you're going to find that beta blockers typically are going to block the beta receptors that would cause the heart to be able to increase. So, beta blockers are going to keep the heart rates low, which therefore should keep blood pressure low. Um, in the case of a high blood pressure situation, this may come in very effective. The one thing that it will do is inhibit a patient's ability to compensate. So if you get a patient that, uh, let's say, goes into shock, let's say they go into hypovolemic shock, and they need uh, more oxygen moved around through their body, well, that's going to, when those hypoxic um, situations are identified by the brain, the compensatory measure is that we would stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, which is going to increase respiratory rate and heart rate. But for our patients on beta blockers, the respiratory rate will go up, the heart rate will not. And so when you're dealing with people on these, you have to be able to think outside the box and think, okay, is this patient in shock? And if you're looking for your typical markers, like increased respirations, increased heart rate, and pale, cool, clammy skin, you aren't going to see the heart rate marker. So don't let that throw you off. If you don't see that, but you suspect your patient may be in shock or going into shock, Take a quick look at their med list. If you see one of these LOL drugs, now you know why they don't have an increased heart rate. Uh, probably the one that we see most of all in the pre-hospital care um, is metropolol. Whoops. And um, we do give that in pre-hospital care for the purpose of uh, beta blockers and things like that. So let's talk really quick about um, our antirhythmics. I'm going to go over these again just a little bit in a little more detail, but I kind of wanted to cover what drugs are in what category first. So for our antiarrhythmic drugs, um, you're going to recognize some things on the list. 
you're going to recognize lidocaine. We talked about that um, in lab. Lidocaine is a cane drug, uh, much like Novocaine, and it's going to have that numbing effect or desensitizing effect on our cells. Um, procainamide has that cane in the middle. So procainamide fits in that same uh, field. Now, procainamide is in your ACLS algorithms. It used to be given more up front than it is now. Um, it used to be kind of one of those things that we went to after we um, exhausted all of our lidocaine. Then we could go to procainamide. That is still an option for us. So um, if you're using lidocaine or amiodarone um, and you exhaust it, you could, uh, I would contact medical direction, but you could consider procainamide. Um, procainamide has got some uh, unique qualities that we'll talk about in just a minute when we get to those. Um, adenosine is the antiarrhythmic that we're going to give for uh, supraventricular tachycardias or atrial tachycardias. Um, and that's a very quick, rapid uh, six milligram flush initially. Um, and then it's followed by a very quick 12 milligram flush if the first one isn't, or dose. Um, if the first one is ineffective. Uh, Marapamil is another drug that we can give. It's carried. We rarely give this, but it can be given uh, uh, much like adenosine in the rapid atrial tachycardias or uh, supraventricular tachycardias. Um, Diltiazem, we'll talk about a little bit later when we get down to that. Uh, amiodarone is probably our go-to guy for ventricular tachycardias. Um, that and lidocaine. Lidocaine used to be the primary one. Uh, amiodarone has kind of come back on the scene. It used to be an old, old drug that we gave. It's now back on scene and um, has kind of pushed lidocaine out of the front running position as far as the most given drug in a uh, cardiac arrest. Uh, however, lidocaine is still in there. It can still be given. It is much, much cheaper to give. So amiodarone has got a few extra properties. It can be given to someone that's a stable patient in VTAC. And if, if that's the case, we're going to give that um, in a drip form. So we're going to put 150 milligrams uh, into a bag. 100 cc bag would probably be the best. And then administer that over uh, 10 minutes. So it's 150 milligrams given over 10 minutes. You could probably do that in a slow IV push if you're very patient and had a great stopwatch. Um, so we'll talk about some of these other things as we go along. Mag sulfate, um, we'll discuss when we get down here just a little bit. But mag magnesium sulfate is given to strengthen the cell wall. So when we have a cell wall that is lost its integrity, um, it's almost always due to a low magnesium level. And so we see that present in patients with a rhythm called torsadstic point. It is a monomorphic VTAC rhythm. So it's in essence VTAC, but it kind of looks like if you were to twist, twist a ribbon um, where the uh, QRSs get very tall and then they get very short, so it kind of wanes and waxes. Uh, that is torsades de point. Um, magnesium is usually the treatment that will fix that. It's going to reinforce those walls so that we don't um, have that rhythm anymore. Used to be frontline drug. We gave, if you saw torsades, the first thing you did was give uh, two grams of magnesium sulfate. Nowadays, we're looking more for labs. Uh, we're going to treat those people in that rhythm as uh, VTAC patients, if they're awake and stable. If they're uh, unresponsive and have no pulse, then we're going to treat them uh, as pulseless VTAC patients and give them magnesium sulfate once labs are drawn. Okay, okay so um, our parasympathetic. Okay. The drugs that 
stimulate the parasympathetic system, the main one we go to there um, is atropine. And that's going to stimulate that uh, feed and breed system. So that's going to slow our heart rate down. And we talked a little bit today about um, atropine not so much working on the rate of our heart as it blocks the vagal nerve stimulation. So the vagus nerve stimulation, um, once our vagus nerve is stimulated, it drops our heart rate. So atropine blocks that vagus nerve receptor so that um, it doesn't drop our heart rate, which hopefully will allow our heart rate to increase, especially if we're hypoxic or in a stressful situation, then our sympathetic system can take over and increase our heart rate. Okay. Um, digitalis is not something that we give in the field, but you're going to find a lot of patients that take digitalis. And what we see a lot in the field um, are dig overdoses, usually accidental. Um, sometimes it's when they're um, trying to adjust their medications, they may get on a digitalis overdose. Oftentimes, what we see, though, is patients that um, get confused with their medication. So they uh, misunderstand and they thought they were supposed to take one pill twice a day when actually the prescription maybe said half a pill twice a day. Um, so, or people that forget, they take their meds and they can't remember if they take their meds, so they take a little more and then they take them again at nighttime and they just get too much digitalis. Obviously, um, that's going to cause problems because uh, that is feeding and stimulating that parasympathetic nervous system, which is going to drop everything down and, and cause patients to have issues with that because of the low heart rate uh, and other side effects of digitalis. Other things we're going to talk about are anticoagulants, which are drugs that keep us um, from coag our blood from coagulating, and then we'll talk about some of those that are listed here. So, um, sodium bicarb is a buffer. We're going to talk about that when we give it and why. And then we're going to talk a little bit about our pain management in chest pain, um, morphine and nitrous oxide being some of those. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, furosemide being a diuretic and when we would give that. Um, we're going to discuss nitroglycerin, which you guys know a lot about already. And then we're going to talk about calcium chloride and when that would be indicated for us. Okay. So very briefly, um, we're going to talk about the adrenogenic antagonist, um, or those lull drugs. Okay. So this drug actually um, antagonizes those adrenogenic receptor sites. Okay. Um, and so... Those adrenogenics are the beta receptor, um, and uh, so when we block those beta uh, receptors, we call that's the name beta blockers come from. Uh, that's when we get those lull drugs. Okay, so propranolol is one of those. Um, it inhibits the effect of the catecholamines that are in the system. So if they're in the system circulating. Um, those catecholamines are not going to be effective on that um, beta receptor. So the results of propranolol are going to be um, reduced heart rate, like we talk about with metropolol. Um, it's going to reduce our cardi cardiac uh, contractility. So each beat of our heart is going to be less forceful than it was before. Because of that, that's going to reduce our cardiac output, which is going to reduce our blood pressure, but it's also going to decrease our myocardial oxygen demand. And this is a pretty significant issue. If we've got somebody in cardiac arrest, generally they've got their, their sympathetic nervous system is stimulated because they're anxious, their heart may be low on oxygen, so they've got chest pain. And the more anxious they get and the faster their heart beats, the more oxygen it's going to take. So it kind of becomes a snowball effect. If we can go in and treat those patients, provided their blood pressure will tolerate it, with a beta blocker, that's going to decrease that oxygen demand. That's going to decrease 
the amount of oxygen that our heart is going to need to continue to operate. If we can decrease that, then we may be able to provide enough oxygen to feed that need, thus minimizing the emergency until we can get the problem fixed. So, metoprolol, uh, same thing. Uh, we hear this called uh, low pressure a lot. That's probably the main brand name that we hear that by. And low pressure is generally given five milligrams over five minutes. It's a low IV or slow IV push. And uh, you can see it blocks both the beta 1 and beta 2 uh, receptors, which reduces our heart rate. It's going to reduce our systolic blood pressure and it's going to reduce our cardiac output. So we have to make sure that our patient has blood pressure enough to tolerate this. But another thing this does is inhibits tachycardia. So if we've got a patient that's tachycardic um, and has, has a, a good enough blood pressure, we can uh, give them low pressure and sometimes re reduce the tachycardic rhythm there. Um, also, if you've got a patient that's uh, in atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter that's very rapid, this is a nice drug to try because sometimes it controls that ventricular rate, which is really what we're looking at in atrial fibrillation. The atriums are just fluttering and kind of chaotic. In atrial flutter, the atriums are in a rhythmic pattern, but they're very, very fast. Um, what we want is we want that ventricular pace to be slow enough that it can effectively pump to the best of its ability. So by giving uh, metoprolol in these situations, sometimes it helps us to control that and get the patient into a more controlled situation. Atenolol is another one that uh, we may give in pre-hospital. Um, it is a non-selective uh, beta blocker. It also blocks the um, alpha-1 receptors. So this inhibits peripheral vasoconstriction, so it does not allow those uh, peripheral vessels to vasoconstrict, which is going to, it's going to block our sympathetic nervous system in that aspect. So if our sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, our blood pressure should rise. Giving a tenolol is going to keep that from happening to that extent because it's going to keep our peripheral vessels bigger. Um, and it also kind of um, potentiates peripheral vasodilation. So not only keeps them from constricting, but it also causes them to dilate a little bit. This is a drug we see given a lot uh, for, for blood pressure issues. Okay, our antiarrhythmics. Um, I'm going to let you kind of go through this. This is in your textbook. It's a nice um, table in chapter five or in chapter seven that talks about the different classes of the antiarrhythmics. So you're going to see there on the left hand side, sodium channel blockers are, are our class one. Um, those are going to widen the QRS. Um, the one there that we probably will see a little bit of is a procainamide. Uh, the other two we're probably not ever going to use. But they're there, just so you know. Uh, and then the others in that sodium channel blocker underneath there is your lidocaine. And, um, and those are uh, probably our go-to guys for that. Uh, the beta blockers are also in the antiarrhythmic category. And they're... Again, is our lol drug, so propranolol, um, metoprolol, atenolol is in there. Um, you're going to see those. The potassium channel blockers. Now, if you think about that active transport that happens in the cardiac cells, we've got sodium and potassium, and we've got some um, calcium that floats back and forth through those um, channels that are open in the cell wall. So when we block those, we drastically change the way the cells can depolarize and repolarize. So anytime we block something, if we block the sodium channel blockers, um, it keeps that repolarization 
slows it way down. So the heart, the heart cell can't just reset itself very quickly and then depolarize and fire again. Um, it takes time, and that's what slows our heart rate down. Um, so our potassium channel blockers are going to be the same. Now here's our big, big boy, the amiodarone is in there. And so um, it works similar to the sodium channel blockers, only it works on the potassium side. And again, it takes both of those to depolarize and repolarize. So when we block one of those channels, whether it's the sodium channel or the potassium channel, um, we slow that process down. And then verapamil and diltiazem are the calcium channel blockers. So calcium does play a part in that um, repolarization and depolarization. So when we block that, it slows it down, not as much as it will with amiodarone and lidocaine, but it, it, it's significant enough to consider. And then miscellaneous uh, categories are the adenosine and the digoxin. Adenosine, again, is that chemical um, cardioversion, that chemical electrical shock that we're going to do. Okay, So if you look here, um, look at the effects of the alpha and beta receptor site on the heart. So on the heart, um, when we talk about those beta receptors being blocked, then we have increased heart rate, increased contractility force, increased automaticity, and that's our rate. Automaticity is the, the rate that our heart sets to be that. So uh, those beta-1 receptors affect all of that. Um, beta-2 is going to cause uh, vasodilation, or as the alpha receptors is going to cause vasoconstriction. And then in the lungs, the alpha are going to cause mild bronchoconstriction, whereas the beta-2 is going to cause bronchodilation. So beta-2 is going to allow us to open up our bronchioles so that we get more air in. That comes from that sympathetic nervous system uh, response as well. So our antiarrhythmics are useful in the treatment of cardiac arrhythmias, specifically, um, probably most predominantly cardiac arrest, but lots of other arrhythmias too. Um, atrial arrhythmias, such as atrial tachycardia, um, SVTs, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, um, and then they're useful in treatment of our ventricular rhythms too, such as VTAC and VFib. Okay. Uh, lidocaine, uh, we talked about suppresses the depolarization in the ventricles, um, but in the doses that we give it, it should not slow that AV conduction, um, and it doesn't affect the contractility in the heart muscle. So it's just going to keep the cells from depolarizing quite so quickly. Procainamide um, is a good one to use if other antiarrhythmics don't work. This is kind of our backup plan. So um, it works in much the same way. It slows the intraventricular conduction, so the conduction between the ventricles are slowed and um, slows that heart rate in the ventricles only, much more than uh, lidocaine does. So this is a little more potent than lidocaine. Okay. Now this is kind of the particularly interesting part about procainamide. It has these four what we call endpoints. So this is when you would no longer give procainamide. And you might potentially see these on a quiz somewhere. Just saying. Okay. So the four endpoints are if your arrhythmia goes away. So if your if your rhythm changes, we're done with procainamide. Okay. If our patient becomes hypotensive, then we're done with procainamide. And you're going to watch your QRS. If our QRS widens by 50% or more, then we're done. And the last one is when we reach our total dose of 17 milligrams per kilogram. Once we reach that dose, which is really quite a lot, um, then we'll have to quit and go to another plan. So take a look at those four endpoints.
adenosine um, we're going to use on supraventricular arrhythmias. So its half-life is approximately 10 seconds. So we talked about giving this in a very proximal IV site. So go as high as you can on the arm or the IO in the humeral head to uh, give this drug because you've got 10 seconds to get it to the heart before the body absorbs it to the point that it's not going to be effective. This is a naturally formed in uh, where was it? agent in the body. So the body absorbs it very quickly because it's uh, used to having it in there, it's used to dealing with it. Uh, a lot of people re recall this chemical cardioversion. So it works the same as electricity in the fact that it completely depolarizes the cells in the heart once it gets there. Studies have shown that it's effective in about 90% of the uh, supraventricular tachycardic events that come in. So it does work a lot of the time. Uh, oftentimes the six milligram dose, the first dose, isn't effective, but frequently when you go to that 12 milligram dose, that becomes effective. So it's a very useful tool. It's really cool to see. It is a little bit frightening for your patients because it completely stops their heart, and that is a horrible feeling. So kind of give them a heads up. I would not use the terms, we're going to stop your heart, because talk about making anxiety. Um, so just say, we're going to give you a drug, and you might feel a little funny for a few seconds, and at least give them a heads up. If you have got a patient that um, has a tachycardic event, and it is so fast that you cannot tell what rhythm they're in, this is kind of a nice diagnostic tool. You can give it, it may slow it down for just a little bit so that you can print a strip and make a diagnosis before it speeds back up. Now, I will say when you give adenosine, start running your recorder, start running your strip as you're giving it. And let that recording paper run until you get your reperfusing rhythm uh, because you want to be able to document all of that. Same thing if you're giving it for a diagnostic tool. Print that whole thing out because your window that you're able to see that it slows down may be very, very short. You want to capture that as effectively as you can. Okay. So patients with atrial fibrillation are probably not going to get adenosine unless we know that they haven't been in atrial fib for more than 24 hours. Um, the reason is atrial fibrillation has got blood pooling in the atrium. So if that blood clots, and then we hit it with this chemical cardioversion, we're now going to shoot those clots all over the system. And we may cause MIs and strokes and all kinds of things. So um, we're going to go a different route with those patients. Um, so patients that have torsades de point, what we talked about earlier, won't uh, get amiodarone. If you've got second or third degree heart blocks, we're going to avoid that. Um, and patients with a history of asthma, we're going to um, not go there with them because it can potentiate uh, respiratory issues with them. Okay. Narapamil is a calcium channel blocker. We talked already about what those um, blocking those calcium channels in the heart do. And so it's going to um, slow the heart rate. It's also going to slow conduction through the AV node. So if you've got a rapid ventricular or atrial rate and a rapid ventricular rate, let's say you've got a fib and your a let's say a flutter and your a flutter is running crazy and your ventricles have decided they're going to try and keep up. So remember we call that. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, if you've got a fib and then. Um, your ventricles decided they're going to keep up. We call that AFib with RVR, rapid ventricular response. So if we would give verapamil, it would slow that conduction through the AV node, which would slow our ventricular rate because it takes longer for that electrical impulse to get through the AV node down to the ventricles. Okay. Diltiazem or cardizem uh, is the brand name that we see this by almost always, um, is a calcium channel blocker. This is a great tool for those people with um, atrial fibrillation. So if they've got AFib, uh, we could think about cardizem. 
If you've got somebody that you give adenosine to to stop your SVT or your uh, your atrial uh, tachycardias and they don't respond, this is your good backup plan. Uh, so again, it slows conduction through the AV node, uh, causing that to slow the whole the whole heart down. It also relaxes the vascular smooth muscles, so it kind of dilates those um, vessels. And cardiogram is given with a bolus initially, and then followed up by a drip. So I have had several patients that did not respond to adenosine, but responded very well to cardiogram. So they kind of um, were on our list of regulars, and when we got there, we knew that this was probably going to be the treatment we were going to go to. Okay. However, this can cause um, systemic hypotension, so you've got to make sure that you've got a hemodynamically stable patient in that area. Um, and if for some reason we would have an overdose of cardizem, uh then we could use calcium chloride would be the antidote for this calcium channel blocker overdose. Amiodarone, we talked quite a bit about. You guys are learning about this week, so this is something that should kind of be a review for you. Um, it's a very potent antiarrhythmic, and it's our first line um, antiarrhythmic usually given in cardiac arrest. So it affects the sodium, potassium, and calcium channels. So it blocks all three of those, effectively reducing the heart's cell's ability to depolarize very quickly. So um, it has, because of that, alpha and beta blocking properties both. Um, I think we talked about amiodarone being given in multiple ways. Um, it can be given as a bolus, IV bolus. It can also be given as a drip for your stable ventricular tachycardic patients. Okay. Max sulfate is an antiarrhythmic that we talked about used in torsades de point. And um, if we see that, then we, we really want to make sure we get some labs very quickly because we're probably going to be giving some magnesium to this patient based on their mag levels. So if they're very, very low, we'll probably give a high dose. Um, if they're uh, only slightly low, then we'll adjust that dose. Typically, without labs, uh, I think two, milli or two grams is the first dose of magnesium. So our parasympatholytics, these are medications that stimulate um, our parasympathetic nervous system, and oftentimes you hear these called anticholergenics. Okay. So our sympathetic nervous system and our parasympathetic are opposite of each other, and they both play a role in trying to keep things balanced in our system. If one of them gets out of hand, the other one steps it up to balance things back out. So if you can think about your fight or flight and then think exactly the opposite, that's your parasympathetic. So uh, parasystolis is one thing that it uh, stimulates. It causes pupillary constriction. And, and remember, in our fight or flight, we have that pupillary dilation so we can see better. So this one constricts our pupils, decreases our heart rate, decreases our respiratory rate, ultimately um, probably decreasing our blood pressure. Okay, um, And the primary nerve in this whole system is the vagus nerve. Now, this becomes an issue uh, with some people that are particularly, you're going to have a time in your paramedic career guaranteed that you're going to pick somebody up off a toilet who has been bearing down to have a bowel movement, stimulated their vagus nerve, and passed out or died. So that just happens, and we have to recognize it. The other thing that we need to keep in mind, when you're innovating, particularly children, your laryngoscope blade, when you go to innovate, can stimulate that vagus nerve. Or when you're suctioning a child, when you're deep suctioning a child, um, you can stimulate this vagus nerve. And so if, if you're working on the airway of a child and that heart rate drops, it's probably because you stimulated this vagus nerve. 
Atropine is the drug that we give for our bradycardic patients. And what it does is it blocks that vagus nerve stimulation. So it's got positive chronotropic properties and no inotropic. So chronotropic is um, I lost my brain of thought here. So chronotropic and inotropic are two terms that you probably need to know. Okay, so chronotropic affects the rate of the heart. So a positive chronotropic increases the heart rate. A negative chronotropic would decrease it. So atropine is a positive chronotropic agent. Inotropic term refers to the contractility. So atropine really does not affect that one way or the other. Again, a positive inotropic effect would be one that increases the contractility, like dopamine. We talked about that earlier. And um, other thing that we would give atropine for is the antidote in organophosphate poisoning. Organophosphate poisonings are probably their nerve agents. So in other parts of the world, that would probably be a, a major concern. Not so much here, but in our setting in the Midwest, um, we see this mostly as pesticides. So a pesticide overdose um, or a pesticide exposure is an organophosphate poisoning. And we were going to give um, tons and tons of atropine. So if that happens and you know you have that, you might um, call the ER and let them know what you're coming in with because they're going to need to stock up on atropine, as are you in the, in the truck. So. Okay. Uh, cardiac glycosides, um, digitalis is the one that we talked about that. It's the oldest medicine known to man, and I think in the very first lecture that you heard, it did talk about DIG and how that was actually um, developed the first time. But digitalis is used to treat uh, congestive heart failure. So this has a positive inotropic effect. So it increases the contractility of our heart. Um, it significantly increases cardiac output. So as you recall, in congestive heart failure, um, the problem with that is, is we don't have cardiac output and so the fluid backs up and it ends up in our lungs because it backs up from the left ventricle uh, back through the pulmonary artery and pulmonary veins and the water actually by osmosis moves across the cell walls into the lungs it's got to go somewhere and therefore we have wet lungs so um, just so you know, digitalis is given for congestive heart failure to increase cardiac output so we get less pulmonary edema. This is not something that we give pre-hospital like ever, um, but we are going to see a lot of patients on DIG because we take care of a lot of CHF patients. Anticoagulants are medications that inhibit our blood from clotting. So typically where we're going to see these used is in acute coronary syndromes uh, or MIs, chest pains. Uh, if we've got embolotic, which means uh, there's an embolus, or thrombotics, there's a clot um, in our brain. So if we've got those uh, clotting or thrombolytic type of strokes, we can give those then. If we've got a PE or a pulmonary embolism, which is a clot not in our lungs, but it's a clot in the vascular system around our lungs. So remember, in a, in a PE, we can still move air in and out. We just can't move the blood around to grab that air or the oxygen. And then we also use it in uh, DVTs, deep vein thrombosis. So those are clots that are in other parts of our body in the vascular system. These are all dangerous because if those clots break loose and get to our heart or our brain, they can cause heart attacks and strokes. So anticoagulants actually go in and kind of dissolve those clots and hopefully open that uh, vein back up so that we can move blood past there again. 
So the most common anticoagulant is going to be Coumadin. You're going to have a ton of patients on Coumadin. Uh, Orphan, Orphan is the other name for that. Basically, Coumadin is rat poison. Okay, um, and that's that's what they put out there in the rat poison. They give it to the mice. The mice eat it because it tastes good to them, and all of a sudden their blood becomes so thin that they it literally seeps out through their vessels and they, they bleed out. Um, typically, this is taken by mouth, uh, and it's probably going to be a, a medication that are is described prescribed to our patients. Um, it can take days to have any therapeutic effects. So if you've got an emergent situation, Coumadin is probably not going to be the drug that's prescribed to them. We're going to think probably more along the lines of heparin. Heparin can be given IV. Um, it is measured in uh, international units, IU, and um, we have two different um, forms of it. So we have uh, fractionated heparin, um, and non-fractionated heparin. So um, heparin by itself, regular heparin, can be given, um, and it's a weight-based bolus, and then they, um, it's a drip after that. The other one that we can give is low-weight or low-molecular weight heparin. Um, Enoxaprine is the generic name for that, and um, let me think here. I should know this. Um, shoot. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think I'm an idiot here. Um, but the fractionated heparin is going to be given usually in a shot um, or an injection. And um, it is kind of long term. So once they give that, they've given it and it's done, a lot of physicians like that because it's. It's in, you don't have to mess with it anymore. A lot of them really don't because you can't control it. Once it's in there, it's kind of a uh, slow acting one. Uh, Lovinox is the name that that's normally seen by or not seen as. And so you give it, but you can't really um, take it back out. So with our regular heparin, it is not very long acting. So you shut it off and you can send them right to surgery. With the Lovinox, um, you don't necessarily have that option. So uh, that's going to be a physician call, and that's not going to be something we're probably doing pre-hospital. Uh, you will transport a lot of patients with these drugs on board. Uh, and if you happen to be working in a hospital base, you're going to be giving these frequently. A lot of times, heparin and nitro drips are run side by side in patients with chest pain that we're going to go down and have a stent put in. So. Um, know that if you start an IV and you're going to be running heparin and nitro, those are compatible, but only for a short period of time. So if they're going to be running more than an hour, you need to have two IV lines for those so that you can separate them out. Okay. The other one that we're going to throw in here with the anticoagulants is aspirin. And we've already gone over aspirin. We know the um, properties of aspirin. Basically, it inhibits platelet aggregation. So we take those platelets, um, you've probably heard me say, I call it the PAM of platelets. Um, there's little sticky things on our platelets that when those platelets are activated, these little sticky things come out and they stick together. Aspirin keeps those little sticky things from coming out. So it keeps them slick. So instead of sticking together, they simply bounce off each other or slide right next to each other and go on their very little way. So this is highly effective if you've got a um, MI, that's a clot, if you've got a clot in your coronary arteries, this is a great thing to do. If we know for absolute certain we have a patient that's having a stroke that is a clot, this would be a great thing to give. But we don't ever know that for certain until we get them to the hospital and they do a CT. So um, with our stroke patients, they do not ever get aspirin. Okay. Plavix is a, a platelet, platelet aggregation inhibitor. And this is something that I think initially we talked about giving this pre-hospital and it was kind of the thought that we would as soon as we found a patient that's having an MI, we would get them on Plavix. 
um, or clopidogrel is the generic name for that. But there has been several kind of setbacks with Plavix. It is a great drug. A couple of things that are troubling with it, it's very expensive. And so patients that don't have good insurance um, to cover this, uh, it's probably not a good idea to start them on it because of the expense. Um, the other thing is, if they suddenly get off of it, uh, the effects of that have been pretty dismal, especially with our diabetic patients. So there's some ongoing studies. There was a class action lawsuit a few years ago with people suing uh, physicians and drug companies because their loved ones were on Plavix. They were taken off and they immediately died. And there was quite a large number of those people. So Plavix is now given more to people that have um, coded stents put in their heart. So if they've got this coded stent, and it's actually coded, the stent goes into their coronary arteries, and it's a little wire mesh thing. Sometimes, depending on the size of the artery, they will coat that little mesh frame with chemotherapy drugs. And they have found that adding Plavix to that has been a good mesh, but they're going to be on Plavix probably for the rest of their life. So they need to make sure that they can, A, number one, be compliant with that, that they're the type of patient that is going to take their meds and they can afford it because taking them off has not, um, not been a good thing. So if they've had a recent stroke, myocardial infarction, MI, um, or if they've got peripheral vascular disease, which puts them at high risk for both a stroke and an MI, they might be candidates for Plavix. Okay. Fibrinolytics are, are drugs that we can give that will actually go in and dissolve clots, and they're very clot-specific. Um, aspirin, again, is going to be in here because it kind of has that property. Uh, but it, it, as simple as aspirin is, it's had a really good effect in reducing mortality in uh, heart attack patients. So the three fibrinolytics that I'm going to just talk about tonight, um, there's a whole bunch of others, but I'm going to talk about these three. Uh, streptokinase was probably the original. And when we first started giving streptokinase, we started it because we were doing balloon angioplasties, which means they would, they would find an artery that was blocked. They would put this little balloon down in there, blow it up, which would, in essence, break all that plaque loose, and um, they would kind of catch it down the road, but they'd break that plaque loose and then take the balloon out. Well, it worked really good, except it almost immediately grew right back. And so a lot of those patients, up to about 80% of them, were restenosing within the next couple of years. <coughs> So, we had to do some revamping. It was a great idea. It was a good starting place. Um, so, that's kind of the grandpa of the fibrinolytics. The next one that we kind of came uh, into, into play was TPA. Oh, shoot. Was TPA down here at the bottom. And that's tissue, tissue plasmogen activator. TPA um, had a little better results than streptokinase, um, but they were still restenosing um, at about 35% rate. So they looked for something better, and today what we use is um, what they call TNKs um, or tenecteplase. And um, tenecteplase is used primarily for patients who are having MIs. So if they're having an MI and they are a distance away from a facility that can perform a PCI, a percutaneous intervention, um, or they placing the stent. So if they don't have a cath lab close by, we can consider tenecteplase um, because that's going to go in and, and be very effective at dissolving that heart in patients that qualify. Now, there are time frames they have to meet. There are medical um, 
criteria that they have to meet, like they cannot have had any bleeding disorders recently. They cannot have had any recent surgeries. Um, they can't have like bleeding ulcers. They can't. Um, there's a whole list of things that they have to meet. However, we've kept TPA on board because for whatever reason, TPA has been very effective in strokes. So TPA still remains our number one treatment in stroke patients, whereas tenecteplase um, is kind of the front runner when it comes to clots within our MI system. A couple other things that we're going to talk about are the buffers. And when we get to um, some more of the medical issues, when we're talking about acidosis and alkalosis a little more in depth, um, we're going to talk about our buffer system. And one of the meds that we can give when a patient is acidotic, so if they are high on the acid levels, um, we can give them some alkaline to help balance that out. And um, you can see here that our normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45, uh, 7.4 being the norm. But when we become hypoxic or have some other issues that um, can alter that, then our serum pH can fall quickly, which makes us acidotic. So sodium bicarbonate is our go-to person for this. We carry this on the squad. We used to give it routinely in a cardiac arrest that we did CPR in more than, um, for more than 30 minutes. And that has kind of gone away because we found that we were probably doing more harm than good with that. So in some instances, especially if we have known acidosis, we're going to give sodium bicarb. It is also the antidote for tricyclic antidepressant overdoses. It's the antidote for phenobarbital overdoses, phenobarbital being a drug, it's kind of an older drug, uh, but it's given for seizure, uh, seizure patients um, on an ongoing basis. So phenobarbital is something they would take every day. And if we have a patient that has known hyperkalemia or high calcium levels, then we're going to give sodium bicarb. So that's um, that. Diuretics, um, sometimes our patients have too much fluid in their system. So we may see that in the case of our CHF patients. Uh, we could see it in the place of um, our patients that have pedial, uh, pedial edema, uh, pitting edema. Sometimes you're going to find patients that just are edematous everywhere, and they're really just carrying way too much fluid, and it's causing them to have some significant issues. Um, Probably CHF being the main one of those that we see frequently. So when the heart, we talked about this before, loses the ability to pump blood, um, if it loses that ability on the left side of the heart, then we have blood that pools in the lungs, calling, causing pulmonary edema. If the failure in our heart is on the right side of the heart, then we see that edema out into our system. So you're going to get um, edema at the lowest part of the body. So depending on where your patient is positioned, normally the feet and the legs, but if they're in a recliner or bed, you may see it back in the buttocks, a lower abdomen, or lower back area. So if those patients are carrying way too much fluid, it does cause problems. It causes problems with the vascular system. It causes problems with the circulatory system, uh, which ultimately results in problems with respiratory and cardiac. So our objectives are, with these patients, are to increase cardiac output and reduce our pulmonary and peripheral edema. So furosemide, or Lasix, is kind of our go-to guy. We used to give this a lot pre-hospital. There was some studies that came out that said that if it's given too quickly, that we can cause all kinds of issues. Um, and looking at the studies, those were kind of random. Um, not real frequent issues, but it did become a big issue. And so this is not something that we give pre-hospital anymore, uh, unless, you know, rare occasion we may give Lasix. But if you've got somebody in, in serious congestive heart failure, this would certainly be something we consider. It stimulates the renal system to get rid of that fluid much more quickly. Okay. 
Um, anti-anginal agents, so P, uh, drug medications that we would give uh, for chest pain. Um, as you know, chest pain usually happens when the coronary arteries get plaque built up in them uh, to the point that we're not moving a blo enough blood and oxygen past that blockage to supply the cells beyond that point. Interestingly enough, that plaque buildup is usually greater than 90%, most of the time greater than 95% before you ever have any signs of symptoms. So a lot of people are like, holy cow, my man's got three coronary arteries that are more than 90% blocked. <laughs> um, that's not really all that bad because generally we don't find them until they're 95, 98. My dad had a five bypass surgery. He had five ma main arteries in his heart that were more than 98% blocked. And he did not have any chest pain whatsoever until the day before his surgery. So that, I think, I find that quite interesting. So um, exercise and other things can make this chest pain obviously more excruciating. Um, a lot of times you'll have patients that are diagnosed with blockages in the heart, but they're not substantial enough to uh, qualify them for a stent or uh, a surgical intervention. So a lot of times these patients are diagnosed nitroglycerin, so if they get chest pain, they've got a way to work through that. And so uh, your nitroglycerin is going to be that one uh, for that. And you all know how to give nitro. So hypertension, um, because of the manifestations of the disease, causes damages to organs body-wide. Um, but very sudden increases or decreases in blood pressure um, has system-wide consequences. So when we raise or lower blood pressures, we want to make sure that we do that um, in a manner that is controlled and measured. We don't want to do that... Um, drastically. So in our patient that has a high blood pressure, we would like to start working on getting that lowered. Um, but if you have a relatively short transport time, it is not super emergent that we do that pre-hospital. We're actually going to cause a lot more tr trouble lowering that blood pressure too quickly than we are uh, leaving it where it is. So, um, hypertensive crisis is somebody that's uh, 180 over 120 or higher and has evidence of uh, an organ dysfunction, uh, like encephalopathy. So, if they've got an altered mental status, then we want to think about that. Um, if they've got an inter intracerebral hemorrhage or bleeding in the brain, um, if they've got an MI because of this, we want to think about um, working on those very quickly. Okay. Um, or we want to think about if they've got a dissecting aortic aneurysm. So that AAA, we want to probably um, start working on getting that blood pressure lowered because that could make that aneurysm actually burst. Or preeclampsic patients or pregnant patients who are now having seizures, um, that is life threatening to the mom and the baby, so we want to address those. So, in those situations, we want to act on those fairly quickly. So, our initial goal is going to be to reduce our blood pressure by no more than 25% um, within that first hour. Okay. So, if we can stabilize them at 160 over 100, um, Within the next two to six hours, we're gonna we're gonna go there, and we're not gonna go any lower for a while. Um, so if we lower it too quickly, we can cause the whole renal system, uh, the brain system, uh, to collapse and become ischemic, and that can be uh, detrimental. So hypertensive urgencies, um, other things we can look at that kind of are. The signs and symptoms of what we talked about before are headaches, shortness of breath, epistaxis, 
which is like my favorite word, means a bloody nose, and uh, cases of severe anxiety. Uh, we address the anxiety because it's really hard to tell anxiety from a cardiac uh, event such as an MI. So I think we talked about that. Uh, other cardiovascular medications that we can give would be calcium chloride. Uh, calcium chloride um, is something that we're going to give if we have a patient that is hypocalcemic. So they are low in calcium. Because that is one of the essential cardiac components in the repolarization and depolarization of the cardiac cell, as well as our other cells, uh, that plays a potential part. So when we get low on calcium, that can have uh, dysrhythmias associated with it, uh, muscle weakness, tremors, all kinds of things. So it causes, um, for the most part, the calcium is going to have an effect on the force of our cardiac contractions. So um, we're going to lose our cardiac output because we're losing that inotropic force when we lose our calcium. Um, and it really doesn't take a great change in calcium levels to start to see those things happen. Okay. Um, it also increases our ventricular automaticity. So it's going to increase our chances of our patient having a ventricular rhythm because it's hypoxic. Um, so that's going to throw them into maybe VTAC or VFib, which both of those are bad. Um, calcium chloride is our antidote if we have a magnesium sulfate overdose. Um, it's also used to treat um, hyperkalemia, which is elevated potassium. If you have a patient that's on dialysis and they're in cardiac arrest, we are going to assume that they are hypokalemic until proven otherwise. Just because of the way dialysis works, um, oftentimes those patients are hypokalemic, and which can throw them into cardiac arrest. So this is a drug we would consider highly on our diuretic patients, uh, or our, uh, not diuretic patients, on our patients that are on dialysis. And it's also used for hypocalcemia. So if we have low calcium, then we can use this. And that is all I have for you tonight. Aren't you just glad? So I hope this helped kind of clarify some things and get you familiar with some of the drugs that you really do need to be familiar with. So have a great week, and we will talk to you soon.